Hi, and welcome to the Library 2035 Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries webcast series. My name is Sandy Hirsch, and I'm the editor of this book. I am pleased to host this webcast series featuring several of the book's contributing authors who will share their vision for libraries over the next decade. Today, I welcome Anthony Chow, author of Chapter 7, The Future of Libraries, a user and community-centered perspective. Anthony Chow is professor and director of San Jose State University's School of Information. He has worked for the past 23 years teaching and conducting research in information, seeking behavior, usability, and UX in digital spaces, leadership and management, instructional design and technology integration, and informatics and anal analytics. Throughout chapter seven, Anthony Chow outlines how, while the library's why has not changed much over time, the library's how will continue to evolve and change. He highlights how libraries need to pay attention not only to the technological change, but also to the health and wellness of the community that the library serves. He discusses the importance of making data-driven decisions in determining the services most desired and needed by their communities. So hi, welcome, Anthony. Ciao, it's really great to talk to you today. Yes, likewise. Thank you so much, Sandy, for uh, inviting me to talk uh, further about the, the chapter. I'd like to open up our conversation today to ask you to briefly describe your vision of the future of libraries for 2035. Sure, absolutely. Um, given the continued rapid evolution of technology led by AI, robotics and extended reality, the how and what uh, people in the community, what they need and want is more important than ever. The why of libraries being as a, a, being a trusted source for vetted information, a place for transliteracies, a place to go to free access will still remain. Our how and what, however, will need to change with the preferences and needs of the people we serve while also helping address the growing digital divide that technology brings as it's more expensive than print books. Not everyone in society is going to have access to it. Thank you. Um, and as we're looking toward this future, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about what you are most concerned about as we look ahead. So uh, as the digital age continues to rapidly expand, I, I, I'm, I'm most concerned about the, uh, again, the digital divide. Um, so as more services, case in point, um, my parents uh, uh, at, at 85 had a difficult time navigating a lot of the uh, web-based uh, forms and, uh, that um, they needed to rely on uh, in terms of support, social security, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think my biggest concern is that as more of our lives are digital, uh, I think that it's going to leave more people behind. And so I, I believe that the digital divide uh, is is even greater now and with the potential for it to, to be even wider in the future. Yeah, I can see that uh, we have a lot of examples of uh, those kinds of challenges that people are facing navigating this, uh, this future. And so I think that's an important thing for us to be thinking about. On the other hand, what excites you about the future? Well, on the flip side, I think uh, what excites me about the future is that uh, as information professionals, uh, the digital age and technology uh, greatly enhances uh, the quality of potential, potential quality of the information we provide, the more people that we represent um, and support. Um, case in point, uh, my rental car that I'm driving, Sandy, has a built-in GPS in the dashboard, I mean, in the window, right? And, and so uh, the ability to uh, access information uh, and use it to uh, improve the quality of uh, our lives, uh, I think, is, uh, um, is exponential. That's great. And what do you think, as we look back, what has had the biggest impact on libraries over the past decade? Uh, again, I, I think it's uh, digital. So when I think about the um, the uh, computer uh, computers and libraries and uh, teaching uh, people that otherwise did not have access to computers, uh, digital literacy, 
Uh, we think about uh, ebooks and and uh, we still have authors, Sandy, right? But now the the stories and books uh, that are being told are in multiple formats, and so I think that ultimately um, that has again expanded the value. I think of libraries, uh, but I think certainly uh, the digitization, databases, ebooks has really cha- transformed how libraries operate. And. What do you think has had um, the big, we'll have, I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> so where we we just finished what had the biggest impact on the past decade, right? <laughs> I'm yes. very thrown by not having you, Lane. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, um, yeah, we'll just edit this bit out. Um, so what do you think will have the biggest impact on libraries in the next decade? Uh, again, I hate to be redundant, but I think uh, it is uh, it is technology. I think AI, robotics, um, the the way in which information is organized and consumed is going to continue to be very diverse. Um, so that's going to change libraries. I continue to change libraries in many ways. So one of the the significant ways in which libraries have been changed by the digital age is that uh, m- less and less physical spaces being uh, put aside for print books. And so what happens is that that space is now reclaimed uh, and is being used in different ways. And so I think libraries in particular are using it for um, open spaces, meeting spaces, uh, exploratory spaces. And so I think that's very exciting. And I think that uh, ultimately in the next 10 years, I mean, AI is real uh, and its impact on all of us is going to be real. You add that to robotics and other devices, and uh, again, I think it's going to redefine and reshape the physical spaces of libraries. And so I do envision uh, robotic librarians, uh, not not replacing librarians, but robotic assistants, uh, uh, VR glasses, uh, and things like that in libraries. But then on top of that, is with those devices, we now, again, have uh, ways in which to deliver information in multifaceted ways. So I think it's going to be a really exciting time, scary, but at the same time, uh, I, I encourage, and that's one of the reasons why I wrote the chapter, is to lean into that, that ultimately, when, when push comes to shove, the ultimate winner of all of this are the people that we're trying to serve uh, because uh, they we will have so many different ways in which we can support their needs. Uh, I think it's really an exciting time. But I definitely think the look and feel of libraries are going to change. I think uh, the the use of technology in terms of the modernization is going to continue to to grow in libraries. Uh, and I think, again, in the end, uh, no matter how uh, tech enriched a society we are, no matter where you are in the world, there will always be people that won't have that. Right. And so I think that, again, libraries are going to have to continue serving as the great equalizer. And I was wondering, you know, it's been a few months since you submitted, submitted your book chapter um, to the book. Uh, I was wondering if, if, any, if your thinking's changed at all since you've uh, written that chapter. No, not really. I, I think that uh, it goes to show, like, it, goes, it goes without saying that AI has grown even faster than, than I think we anticipated. Uh, Tesla has gotten involved in and the uh, kind of integration of AI and robotics. So apparently uh, Tesla alone is moving that whole area uh, rapidly forward uh, and and faster than expected. Uh, So no, I think in the end, it's it's relatively the same facets that we talked about in our chapter. I do think it reiterates the importance of the chapter uh, because um, how society and people that we serve are going to consume information are going to continue to change, right? And so we have to be uh, really aligned to those changes to make sure that we remain open. Do you have any advice for information professionals as they look toward the future in the next 10 years? Yeah, I think that um, uh, li- librarians, like LS professionals have to continue to lean into the technology and all the different ways in which people are accessing information. Uh, and the reason for that is because ultimately, 
uh, the, the the battle or challenge to remain relevant really resides in our ability to serve people uh, in, in society and, and community members. And so, well, as professionals, I think uh, you, you have to be a a, a very uh, assertive consumer. Uh, so, I, like I, I tell students, you. My, my suggestion to my students is to always make sure you invest money in technology as a consumer, uh, because then you get to see all the different ways in which um, information is accessed and the challenges that go alongside that. So I think that and I say that because ultimately we don't know what the future uh, is going to hold, Sandy. And so it's critical for LS professionals to be as agile as possible uh, because uh, we don't know what uh, what is going to be provide, pre presented to them. And we don't know what challenges their, their uh, respective communities are going to be facing. And so the more diverse you can be, the more likely you'll be able to, to um, uh, evolve and adapt uh, quickly. And is there anything that information professionals can do to better prepare for their desired future? Yeah, so I think it goes back to my prior comment. I would say one area of the budget there's never enough money, Sandy, uh, would be to make sure that you're investing in your personal technology, uh, be, be kind of a, uh, you know, experiment. And, and uh, you know, again, as a consumer, what is it you need in your day-to-day -day life? And try to uh, invest in technology to, to push the envelope a little bit. Um, uh, and I think that uh, the other would be to um, not forget the primary purpose of librarianship, which is to, is to make sure that we equalize the playing field. Uh, and, and, and so I think that as I talk about technology, um, we first and foremost cannot forget about um, in the value of reading, uh, in the value of equal access to that information, especially at a young age. Uh, one, one librarian, he was in Oregon, uh, told me something that really resonated, which is she uh, uh, approaching me as a professor said that, you know, she would like the RI school to focus a little bit more on preparing all librarians on, on the value and exp uh, expertise of, of kind of child development. And her point was, is that uh, as we all know that, is that uh, especially that third grade level is one of the important benchmarks for, for literacy uh, that uh, more and more librarians are aware of that importance, uh, so that we can uh, try to try to help uh, children. You know that in particular, children that may not have access or as much access to uh, reading and literacy resources. I think that's a good um, kind of following then to what key competencies do you think that librarians will need to thrive in twenty thirty five. So, yeah, I mean, kind of tying into my book chapter, um, I think that we have to be uh, very um, fluent with um, data, uh, being able to collect data, uh, being able to talk to, again, the people that we serve, uh, being able to visualize data, and being able to present that data uh, both to uh, the patrons and uh, decision makers. I think tied to that is a, a focus on, uh, again, community uh, and user assessment. Uh, so not, not one person or one community or one race or ethnic group is created equal, right? Uh, and, and so uh, we know that there are nuances and, and unique preferences across the board. Uh, and, and then coupled with that, we also know that the majority of people that use a particular branch uh, live you know, within five to seven miles of that branch. And so, uh, so when we're working in libraries uh, in particular, we do serve that unique local community. Uh, and so um, the, the, the battle for relevance will always be there. Uh, and so, I think uh, the, the modern librarian has more resources and data available to them than ever before. Uh, and I think that given the, 
the wide breadth in which um, people and social economic uh, groups can access information. Uh, that that the, the challenge to figure out what it is they want and in what fashion and format uh, is greater than ever. So I think that's why uh, library librarians have to be very uh, adept at using data, collecting data, analyzing data, and and really um, again identifying what their community. Needs. And I have one last question for you, and that is um, my challenge to everyone is to define your view of the future of libraries in six words or less. <laughs> well, I confess, Andy, I spent some time on this one because six <laughs> words <laughs> is hard. But uh, yes, I, I counted them diverse, user centered, innovative, um, equitable and access. Say that again, diverse, user-centered. Innovative, equitable, and access. Excellent, well, very good. Um, that is, you you did it. Uh, you <laughs> got through the six words. Um, and uh, so thank you so much. And I just wanna thank you, um, Anthony Chow, for joining me today. And I really wanna thank you also for your contribution to Library 2035, imagining the next generation of libraries. It's been a true pleasure to talk with you today and to hear more about your vision about the future of libraries. Well, thank you, Sandy. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to participate uh, and, um, contribute to Library 2035. Uh, while our future is uncertain, it is truly ripe with opportunity to serve even more people in our technology-enriched present and future. And thank you to all of you who are attending this webcast uh, with Anthony Chow, author of Chapter 7, The Future of Libraries, a user and community-centered perspective to view author webcasts from this Library 2035 webcast series, please visit the link or use the QR code on your screen.